Hey everyone, you're watching The Esperanza 243. You're watching my book reading project of The Westing Game, part 20. And welcome to the one hour special, what some people like to call our power or power of our whatever. <laughs> um, the people I'm familiar with that use those titles are gamers, so I guess technically that title wouldn't go with this, since this is not a game, this is a book reading. But hey, um, let's see, Ed, let's go ahead and go to, get to the recap. Um, in part 19, we got to see what Theo uh, came up with for his theory of uh, who the murderer and formula could be, whatever. <laughs> and Flora and Turtle got to talk about their stock markets they got involved in. And so she actually, Turtle told her to, uh, but to sell everything and buy WPP, Westing Paper Product, because of an article she read in the Wall Street Journal. And then Sandy reported information to, um, and Flora was at the broker's office watching the what was it? Some sort of tape? The moving tape. And she realized the stock for WPP was rising. Pretty, pretty amazing stuff. And Sandy got to talk to Doug. Otis caught him following him and gave him, gave him a letter that EJ Plum was trying to send out to the tenants. And then once again we're at information Sandy was telling the judge. And that's where we're going to start. I would have guessed Otis had an IQ of minus 10, Sandy said with a smile. Go on to the next air, judge, the judge replied. Deer. D. Denton Deer. Age 25, graduate of UW Medical School, first year intern, plastic surgery, parents live in Racine, not heirs. Weston Connection, engaged to Angela Wexler, see Wexlers, who looks like Sam Weston's daughter, Violet, who was also engaged to be married, but to a politician, not an intern. That's awful complicated, I know, the doorman apologized. But it's the best I could do. Pulaski, Sedell Pulaski, age 50. Education High School, one year secretarial school. Secretary to the president of Schultz Sausages is taking her first vacation in 25 years. Six months saved up time. Lived with widowed mother and two aunts until she moved to Sunset Towers. Walked with a crutch even before she broke her ankle in the second bombing. Now needs two crunches. She paints them. Weston Connection? Question mark. We don't have any medical reports on her muscular ailment, Sandy reported. The nurse at Schultz Sausages said she was in perfect health when she left on vacation. Strange, the judge remarked. A suspicious malady... No apparent Western connection. Somehow, Sadell Pulaski did not seem to fit in. Hmm. Question from me. Is it possible Sadell was the mistake? Sadell Pulaski clasped the translated notes to her bosom. My little secret mustn't peek. She said coyly, but the doctors had come to see Angela. 
The plastic surgeon loosened the tape from her cheek or from her check and peered under the gauze. One graft should do it, but we can't operate until the tissue heals, he said to the intern, then spoke to the patient. Call my secretary for an appointment in two months. He strode out of the room, leaving Denton Deer to replace the bandage. I don't want plastic surgery, Angela mumbled. It still hurt to talk. Nothing to be... Nothing to be frightened of. He's the best when it comes to facial repairs. That's why I brought him in. We'll have to postpone this wed the wedding. We can have a small informal wedding. Mother, mother wouldn't like that. How about you, Angela? What do you want? He knew her unspoken answer was, I don't know. The door flew open and slammed against the adjacent wall. Where do you think you're going? Denton pulled Turtle to a halt by one of the streaming ribbons twisted in her braid. The sign says no visitors. I'm not a visitor, I'm a sister. And get your germy hands off my hair. Denton Deer hurried to seek first aid for his bleeding shin and sent the biggest male nurse on the floor to take care of Turtle, the same male nurse who chased Otis Amber out of the hospital for sneaking up on a nurse's aide carrying a specimen tray and shouting, BOOM! <laughs> Turtle had time for one question. Angela, what did you sign on this receipt this time for after position? Person. I changed mine to victim, Sidel said. Turtle paid no attention to the victim. She was more interested in the two men entering the room, the burly male nurse that, and that creepy of a lawyer, Plum. I gotta go. Don't say anything to anybody, to anybody about anything, Angela, no matter what happens. Not even to a lawyer. You know nothing, you hear? Nothing. She skirted Ed Plum, ducked under the outstretched hairy hands of the male nurse, slid down the hall, scampered down the stairs, and out of the hospital. Hi, how are you? Ed Plum smiled at Angela, ignoring the patient in the other bed. He didn't recognize Miss Pulaski without her painted crutch. <laughs> so sad. I'm sorry to hear about your accident. Otis Amber told me about it. Just thought I'd drop in for a chat. The young lawyer who had admired the pretty heiress from the minute he first laid eyes on her did not have a chance to chat. Grace Wexler entered the room, saw the answer to the clues. Grace Wexler entered the room, saw the answer to the clues. Ed Purplefruit, the murderer, standing over her daughter and uttered a blood curdling shriek. <laughs> Sorry, that's not blood curdling. Three visitors in one day. The first was Otis Amber with a letter and another receipt to sign. Chris had pretended to be scared by the boom, but he wasn't really. He had twisted because he was excited about going to the Westinghouse again, even if he hadn't figured out the clues. Then Florin Bumbach came to see him. He wasn't nervous at all with that nice lady. She smiles that funny smile because she's sad inside. She once had a daughter named Ros Rosalie. She told him how Rosalie would sit in the shop and say hello to the customers and how she would feel the fabrics. Mrs. Bombach made wedding dresses, which are mostly white, so she brought samples of colors so she brought samples of materials with bright colors and patterns, because Rosalie loved colors best. Rosalie had 573 different swatches in her collection before she died. Mrs. Bombach said her daughter might have been an artist, 
if things had turned out differently. What would I have been if things had turned out differently? The third visitor entered, limping. His partner was limping. Too much excitement, his stupid body was jerking all over the place. Denton Deer sat down next to the wheelchair. Take it easy, Chris. Calm down, kid. I'm not the creature from the Black Lagoon, you know. His partner, the doctor, watched horror movies on television, too. Slowly, arms untangled, legs unsnarled. Slowly, Chris stuttered out his news. Florin Bombach felt so guilty about seeing their dropped clue that she had told him one of her clues. Mountain. But we m must m t tell t Turtle. Don't worry, the intern said, displaying a bruised shin. Chris laughed, then stopped. I s sorry. Mountain. Hmm. Denton Deer thought about the pew. Oh, sorry. Denton Deer thought about the new clue. If the treasure is hidden in a grain shed on a mountain plain, I sure don't have time to look for it. Do you? N n n Let's forget the clues. I have something more important to tell you. Don't get excited, okay? Chris nodded. His partner was going to ask for the money. Denton Deer stood. I'll get your toothbrush and pajamas, then we'll go to the hosp hospital. Don't get excited. Chris got excited. How could he explain that what he wanted from his partner was companionship? Not more probing, pricking doctors with their bad news that made his mother cry. Listen, Chris, can you hear me? Just overnight, I found a neurologist, a nerve doctor, a nerve doctor who works on problems like yours. Op p p shin No operation. Did you hear me, Chris? No operation. The doctor thinks a new medicine may help, but he has to examine you. Make some tests. I have your parents' permissions. I have your parents' permission, but no one will touch you unless we talk it over first. You and me together, I promise. Chris grimaced, trying to smile. His partner said talk it over, the two of them together. They were really partners now. You c c can have m money what oh the money later here let me take those you won't need them in the hospital chris clung to his binoculars well i guess you do need them ready here we go all of a sudden he was leaving sunset towers pushed by his limping partner maybe dr deer is not who and what he says he is Maybe he, he is being kidnapped for ransom. Maybe he's being held hostage. Oh boy, he hasn't had so much fun in years. Chapter 19, Odd Relatives. Thursday was a sunny day, a glorious day. The autumn air was crisp and clear. None of the airs noticed. WPP crossed the tape at $44. Forty-four and a half. Forty-six. Forty-six dollars a share. Oh, my! Don't sell until I give the word, Baba, Alice Turtle had said. Baba. The dressmaker smiled at her new name and eased back in the chair. But not for long. WPP. Forty-eight and a quarter. Oh, my, oh, my! Florin Bumbach bit her thumbnail to the quick. If only the child was here. The child was being examined by the school nurse, having been caught again with a radio plugged in her ear. The turtle blamed her misbehavior on a toothache. The only thing that soothes the horrendous pain is listening to music. You should see a dentist, the nurse said. I have an appointment next week, turtle lied. Can I go home now? The pain is truly unbearable. 
No. The nurse packed the tooth with foul-tasting cotton and sent her back to class. So every half hour, Turtle had to ask permission to go to the lab lab lavatory in order to keep up with the la latest stock market reports. Bladder infection, she explained. Crow polished Mrs. Wexler's silver teapot with a Westing disposable diaper for the, fir for the third time. <laughs> Two more days. The, ne the day after next. It was too painful t going back to that house, but Otis said she must to collect her due. It was her penance to go back, not her due. Blessed is he who expects nothing. Boom! Just a warning to keep doors locked, the delivery boy said, dumping a carton of Westing paper products on the kitchen floor. You know, crow old pal, I think I figured out who the bomber is. Crow stiffened as she stared at her distorted reflection in the shining silver. Who? That's right, Otis Amber said. James Shin Who? So I have been pronouncing it wrong. It's who, not ho. He wanted to put the coffee shop out of business, right? Then he had to p bomb his re own restaurant so nobody would suspect him, right? And he catered the Wexler party. Nobody would notice if the caterer brought in an extra box along with the food, right? James Shin Hu was the bomber. Crow's hands trembled, her face lost with hate. That beautiful, innocent angel reborn, Sandy said, her face will be scarred for life. James Shin Hu, beware. Vengeance shall be mine. The judge rearranged her dockets in order to have these last days free. Leave it to Sam Westing to interfere with my work. Oh, leave it to Sam Westing to interfere with her work. Sandy turned to his next entry. It's an interesting one. Crow. Birth, Bertha Erica Crow, age 57. Mother died at childbirth, raised by father deceased. Education when you're in high school, married at 16, divorced at 40. Ex-husband's name, Wendy Wincloppel. <laughs> Hospital records, problems related to chronic alcoholism. Police record, three arrests for vagrancy. Gave up drinking when she took up religion. Started the Good Salvation Soup Kitchen on Skid Row. Works as cleaning woman in Sunset Towers. Lives in maid's apartment on fourth floor. Wants Western connection? Question mark. Really? You don't know, Sandy? Yes, it is interesting, Judge Boyd replied, but it hardly tells us what we want to know. You've got a customer, Jake Wexler pointed a spare rib at the black-clad figure standing at the restaurant door. Must be a bill collector, who said, frowning over his account book. Grace looked up, saw it was only the cleaning woman, and returned to the sports photographs she was sorting. A dozen or more superstars would be framed and hung on one wall of who's on first. Come on over and join us, Jake shouted. Limping to their table, Crow heard Mrs. Bikeser click her tongue. Sinful woman, she'll go to hell with her pride and her covetousness and take that foot butcher of a husband with her. And that one, that fat one, the glutton, the bomber, the mutilator of innocent children. Maybe she is a customer, who thought, recognizing the face clenched in righteous anger as that of a diner not being served fast enough. He rose and pulled out a chair for Crow. 
My wife will be serving a Chinese tea lunch shortly. Madame Hu placed a variety of dumplings on the table, giggled at Jake, and ran back to the kitchen. That titring Madame Hu was a beautiful woman, and quite young. Grace, casting a suspicious eye on her husband, was suddenly seized by a surge of gnawing jealousy. Maybe it was just the fried dumpling. Madame Hu returned to pour the tea. Jake patted her hand. Good, Grace noticed. She's clutching her stomach. About time she felt jealous. The podiatrist turned his smile to crow. Nothing wrong with your appetite, I ha I'm happy to see. Nothing is wrong with my mouth, the cleaning woman replied, looking down at her plate. It's my feet that hurt. That corn you cut out didn't heal yet. I got a callus on the sole of my left foot, and my ingrown toenail is growing in again. Grace clasped a hand over her mouth and ran out of the restaurant. Mr. Who headed for the kitchen. Your trouble comes from, from years of wearing the wrong kind of shoes, Jake lectured. Crow wasn't listening. James Shin Who, the bomber, was coming back. He had something in his he hand. Here, Crow, try these. I invented them myself. Paper inner soles. They'll make you feel like you're floating on air. It's tough standing on your feet all day. Here, take them. Crow examined the two pads of spongy folded paper. How much? Nothing. Compliments of the house. Still suspicious, Crow slipped the inner soles into her shoes and tried walking. What a blessed relief. Otis Amber was wrong. James Shin Hu was a charitable man. He couldn't be the bomber. Crow floated out of the restaurant without paying for her lunch. Really, Crow? Oh, no. Not another... Oh, no. Not another victim! Sadell Pulaski cried, stuffing her notes under the mattress. The nurse wheeled Chris next to Angel's bed and explained that the boy was being tested for a new medication. Are you all right? She asked, bending over the squirming patient. Chris was trying to remove a blank sealed envelope from his bathrobe pocket. He knew his brother had a crush on Angela. He figured Theo must have sneaked upstairs in the wrong bathrobe to slip this letter under Angela's door. Uh-oh. Then remembered she was in the hospital and was too shy to give it to her in person. Look at that smile, Sadell exclaimed. F from Th Theo, he said. Chris hoped to watch Angela read the love letter, but the nurse insisted he return to his room. Bye-bye, good luck, Sadell called. Angela waved a bandaged hand. M Mount T Ten. Chris replied, from T Turtle. Serves her right for kicking his partner. Mountain, Angela thought. Turtle's MT stood for mountain, not empty, and the letter was not from Theo. Your love has two. Here are two for you. Take her away from the sin and hate, now, before it is too late. Again, two clues were taped at the bottom, with majesties. Crow and Otis Amber's clues are not king and queen, she told Sadell. They are with thy beautiful majesties. And it looks like I have to redo that little recording I did earlier. Bummer. Sandy and the judge were still at work on the heirs. Wexler. Jake Wexler, age 45. Podiatrist. Graduated from Marquette. Married 22 years. Has two daughters. See below. Grace Windsor Wexler. Born Gracie Windkloppel. Age 42. Married to above. Claims to be an interior decorator. Spends most of her time in the Chinese restaurant. Or the beauty parlor, she and Jake, see above, have two daughters, see below. 
Angela Wexler, age 20, engaged to marry D. Denton Deer, also an heir, one year college, high grades, victim of third bombing, embroiders a lot. Turtle Wexler, real name Tabitha Ruth Wexler, age 13, junior high school student, plays the stock market, smart kid, but kicks people. Florin Babak calls her Alice. Weston Connection, Grace Winsor Wexler claims that Sam Westing is her real uncle. Angela, Angela looks like Violet Westing, so does Grace in a way, except she's older. Hmm. Sandy fidgeted with his pen. There's something I didn't write down. Maybe I shouldn't tell you, being you being a judge and all, but, well, Jake Wexler, he's a bookie. No, he should not have told her. A small-time operator, I'm sure, Mr. McSouthers, the judge replied coldly. It can have no bearing on the matter before us. Sam Westing manipulated people, cheated workers, bribed officials, stole ideas, but Sam Westing never smoked or drank or placed a bet. Give me a bookie any day over such a fine, upstanding, clean living man. The doorman's face reddened. He pulled the dented flask from his hip pocket and downed several swigs. She had been too harsh. Would you like me to fix you a drink, Mr. McSouthers? No thanks, Judge. I prefer my good old scotch. The judge's outburst was so unexpected, Sandy had a hard time keeping down the last swig. Grace, Wex Grace Wexler's maiden name is not Windsor, it's Windclopple, the judge exclaimed, brackling through the pages of Sandy's notebook. Here it is, Bertha Erica Crow, ex-husband's name, Wendy Windclopple. Sandy stopped coughing and started laughing. Grace Winsor Wexler is related to is, is related to somebody. Yeah? All right, she's related to the cleaning woman. Think she knows, Judge? I doubt it. Besides, we cannot be certain of the rela relationship. I'd like to see the documents in Crow's folder again. I'm sure it's been Cloppel, Judge. I checked all my spellings three times over. Judge Ford reread the private investigator's reports. Mr. McStowthers, it is Wincloppel, but look carefully at the name of the woman in this interview. Bertha Erica Crow. Sh sure, I knew her. She and her pa lived in the upstairs flat. We were best friends, almost like sisters. But she was the pretty one with her beautiful complexion and long gold-red hair. She left school to marry a guy named Wincloppel. Haven't seen or heard from her since. She's not in any trouble, is she? Transcript, transcript of a taped interview with Sybil Pulaski, November 12. Pulaski! Not just Pulaski, the judge pointed out. Sybil Pulaski. Sam Westing wanted Crow's childhood friend Sybil Pulaski to be one of his heirs. He got Sidel Pulaski instead. Gee, judge, I never noticed that. Boy, am I dumb. But what does it mean? Now, why, does, now why did Sandy say he was dumb? He wasn't the one who sent the letters, was he? Or he wasn't the one who wrote the letters? Hmm. What it means, Mr. McSouthers, is that Sam Westing made his first mistake. Chapter 20, Confessions Friday came quickly to the Westing heirs. Too quickly. Time was running out. Turtle skipped school. She was in trouble enough, but she could build her own school and hire her own kind of teachers once she became a millionaire. In spite of having Turtle at her side, Florin Bombach still stared at the ever-changing, endless tape from the, from the edge of the chair, chewed what remained of her fingernails, and and uttered an oh my each time WPP went by. At two o'clock, Westing Paper Products sold at fifty-two dollars a share, its highest price, its highest price in thirty 
er, in 15 years. Now, Baba, sell! Doug, who had a legitimate excuse from classes. Tomorrow was the big track meet. He jogged, he sprinted, he ran at full speed, not on the track, but on the trail of Otis Amber, back and forth from the shopping center to Sunset Towers again and again and again, and, hey, this is a new direction. Otis Amber parked his delivery bike in front of a rooming house and went inside. Doug waited, hidden in a doorway across the street, and waited. People came and went, but no Otis Amber. Doug jogged up and down the block for two hours. Still, no sign of Otis Amber. Doug was cold and hungry, but at least his feet didn't hurt anymore. Last night, when he asked Doc Wexler about his blisters, the podiatrist told him to see his father. His father, of all people! But those paper intersoles really worked. At five o'clock, Otis Amber skipped out of the rooming house, hopped on his bicycle, and returned to Sunset Towers empty-handed. Doug's assignment was over. Well, almost over. Where was Theo? Theo was being passed up in the hospital emergency room after a slight miscalculation in his solution experiment. Fortunately, no one else was around when the lab blew up. You like playing with explosives, kid? The bomb squad detective asked. Accidents in high school chemistry were not unusual, but this student lived in Sunset Towers. I was experimenting on chemical fertilizers, Theo replied, wincing as the doctor probed his shoulder for a glass shard. The first bomb went off in your folks' coffee shop, right? Your mom and your father work you pretty hard, don't they? They work harder than I do. Why all the questions? Your captain said the Sunset Towers explosions were just fireworks. Sure they were, but bombers have a funny habit of going in for bigger and bigger bangs until they get caught. Theo had an alibi. He was nowhere near the Wexler apartment the day the third bomb went off. The detective grunted a warning about careless chemistry, but Theo had already learned his lesson. Ouch! At last, the coffee shop owner himself delivered the up order. The judge came right to the point. Mr. Theodorakis, tell me about your relationship with Violet Weston. I have reason to believe life, a life is in danger, or I would not ask. It was a question he had expected. I grew up in Westingtown, where my father was a factory forearm, foreman. Violet Westing and I were what you'd call childhood sweethearts. We planned to get married someday, where I, when I could afford it, but her mother broke us up. She wanted Violet to marry somebody important. The judge had to interrupt. Her mother? Are you saying it was Mrs. Westing who arranged the marriage, not Sam Westing? George Theodorakis nodded. That's right. Sam Westing tried to involve Violet in his business. I guess he hoped she'd take over the paper company one day. But she had her heart set on being a teacher. Besides, Violet didn't have much of a business sense. After that, her father never paid her much attention. Go on. The judge held the witness in her stare. The subject was becoming painful, and Mr. Theodorakis, Mr. Theodorakis faltered several times in the telling. Mrs. Westing handpicked the poli that politician, probably figured the guy would end up in the White House and her daughter would be first lady. But Violet thought he was nothing but a cheap political hack, a cheap crook. Violet was a gentle person, an only child. She couldn't turn against her mother. She couldn't face marrying that guy. I guess she couldn't find any way out except... Mrs. Weston sort of went off her rocker after Violet's death, and I... Well, it was a long time ago. Thank you, Mr. Theodorakis, the judge said. 
ending the interrogation. The man had a different life now, different loves, different problems. Thank you. You have been a big help. Sandy was now able to complete the entry. Theodorakis. Theo Theodorakis, age 17, high school senior, works in family coffee shop, wants to be a writer, seems only can't find anyone to play chess with. <laughs> Christos Theodorakis, age 15, younger brother of above, confined to a wheelchair, disease struck about four years ago, knows a lot about birds. Weston Connection, father was childhood sweetheart of, Westing, of Sam Westing's daughter, who looked a lot, who looked like Angela Wexler. Mrs. Westing broke up the affair. She wanted the daughter to marry somebody else, but Violet Westing killed herself before the wedding. Neither parents of above our heirs. I hear the new medicine they're trying out on Chris is doing some good, Sandy reported, but the poor kid needs more help than medicine. He'll, he's real smart, you know. Chris could have a real future, be a scientist or a professor even, but it will take a pile of money, more money, than his folks could ever make to put him through college with a handicap like that. The parents interest me more. Why are they not heirs? So Sandy had some thoughts on that, too. Maybe Sam Westing didn't want to embarrass George Theodorakis, him being married and all. Or maybe Sam Westing, or maybe Westing, figured he'd be too busy with his coffee shop to stay in the game. Or maybe Westing blamed him for his daughter's death, figuring they should have eloped. No. If Sam Westing blamed Mr. Theodorakis, he would have made him an heir in this miserable game. There are too many maybes here, which is what Sam Westing planned. We must not allow ourselves to be distracted from the real issue. Which heir did Sam Westing want punished? The person who would hurt him most? And who would that be? The person who caused his daughter's death. Exactly, Mr. McSouthers. Sam Westing plotted against the person he held responsible for his daughter's suicide. The person who forced Violet Westing to marry a man she loathed. Mrs. Westing? But that's not possible, Judge. Mrs. Westing is not one of the heirs. I think she is, Mr. McSouthers. The former wife of Sam Westing must be one of the heirs. Mrs. Westing is the answer, and whoever she is, she is the one we have to protect. Wow, I had forgotten about that. 21. The fourth bomb. What? The door to apartment 2C opened. Florin Bombach screamed and Turtle flung herself in the pile of money they had been counting. It was Theo, not the thief. Can I borrow your bike for a few min for a few hours? It's very important. Theo was not a runner like Doug, who was fuming about his being so late. He needed the bicycle to follow Otis Amber, right now. Turtle stared at him in stony silence. I didn't make that sign in the elevator. Besides, you already kicked me for it. Please, Turtle. She still wouldn't answer, punk kid. I had a long talk with the police today, but I refused to tell them who the bomber was. What's that supposed to mean? What does she think it means? It means that he and everybody else knows that Turtle is a bomber. Never mind. Can I have your bike or not? Why do you want it? Theo ground his teeth. Oh, that makes sense. Take it easy. Anger won't help any more than blackmail did. Try being a good guy. I saw Angela in the hospital today. She sends her regards. What's that supposed to mean? You let me have that bike, Turtle Wexler, or, or else. Turtle did not have to ask what or else meant. Police, bomber, Angela. But how did Theo find out? Here. She threw the padlock key across the room and waited for him to rush out before she let go of the money. 
He's such a nice boy. Sure, Turtle replied, dialing the telephone number of the hospital. Angela Wexler, room 30, room 325. Room 325 is not accepting any calls. Turtle hung up on the Turtle hung up the phone. If Theo knew what others knew, Angela had set off those fireworks wanting to get caught, but it was different now. Now she was confused. Now she was plain scared. They could force they could force a confession out of her in no time. The guilt was right there, staring out of those big blue eyes. Maybe they're questioning her now. Baba, I'm not feeling so good. I think I'll go home t to bed. Weaving through rush hour traffic on Turtle's bike, Theo trailed the bus to a seamy st downtown district across the railroad tracks where Crow and Otis got off. Skid Row. The pair wandered through the dimly lit, littered, and stinking streets, bending over grimy bums asleep in doorways, raising them to their unsteady feet, and leading the ragtag procession into a decaying storefront. Paint was peeling off the letters on the window. Good Salvation Soup Kitchen. A drunken wreck of a man lurched into Theo, who put a quarter into the filthy officer's hand, more out of fright than charity. Snatches of him seemed drifted toward him as the last of the stragglers staggered through the door. Theo crossed the narrow street and pressed his nose against the steamy soup kitchen window. Rows of wretched souls sat hunched on window, hunched on wooden benches. Crow stood before them in her neck, in her neat black dress, her hands raised toward the crumbling ceiling. Behind her, Otis Amber stirred a bowling mess in a big iron pot. Theo pedaled back to Sunset Towers at a furious pace. Whatever brought Crow and Otis Amber to these lower depths was none of his business. He hated himself for spying. He hated Sam Westing and his dirty money and his dirty game. Theo felt as dirty as the derelicts he spied on. Dirtier. The judge thought they had finished with the heirs. Not quite, the doorman said. McSouthers. Alexander McSouthers. Called Sandy, age 65, born Edinburgh, Scotland. Immigrated to Wisconsin, age 3. Education, 8th grade. Jobs, mill worker, union organizer, prize fighter, doorman. Married, 6 children, 2, grand two grandchildren. Weston Connection worked in Weston Paper Plant 20 years. Fired by Sam Weston himself for trying to organize the workers. No pension. <laughs> Sandy turned a blank page. Sandy turned to a blank page, pushed his taped glasses up the broken bridge of his nose, and looked at the judge. Name? It had not seemed sporting to investigate one's own partner, but Mr. But McStallers was right. This was a Western game. Of course, she had kept some facts from him about the other heirs, but only because she did not trust his blabbering. Josie Joe Ford, with a hyphen between Josie and Joe. Age? 42. Education, Columbia, Law Degree, Harvard. The judge waited for the doorman to enter the information in a slow, cramped lettering. He had to be meticulous in order to prove he was better than his 8th grade education. It's a pity he had not gone further. He was quite a clever man. Jobs? Assistant, or assistant District Attorney. Judge. Family Court. State Supreme Court. Appellate Division. Appellate has two P's and two L's. Never married. No children. Western connection? The judge paused, then spoke so rapidly Sandy had to stop taking notes. My mother was a servant in the Westing household. My father worked for the railroad and was the gardener on his days off. You mean you lived in the Westing house? Sandy asked with obvious surprise. You knew the Westings? <laughs> Why is Sandy 
acting so surprised. I barely saw Miss. I barely saw Mrs. Westing. Violet was a few years younger than I, doll-like and delicate. She was not allowed to play with other children, spending especially the skinny, long-legged black daughter of the servants. Gee, you must have been lonely, Judge, having nobody to play with. I played with Sam Westing. Chess. Hour after hour I sat staring down at that chessboard. He lectured me, he insulted me, and he won every game. The judge thought of their last game. She had been so excited about taking his queen, only to have the master checkmate her in the next move. Sam Westing had deliberately sacrificed his queen, and she had fallen for it. Stupid child, you can't have a brain in that frizzy head to make a move like that. Those were the last words he ever said to her. The judge continued. I was sent to boarding school when I was 12. My parents visited me at school when they could, but I never set foot in the Westinghouse again. Not until two weeks ago. Your folks, your folks must have worked. Your mo, your folks, must have really worked hard. Sandy said, "An education like that costs a fortune." Sam Westing paid for my education. He saw that I was accepted into the best schools, probably arranged for my fir for my first job, perhaps more. I don't know. That's the first thing. That's the first decent thing I've heard about the old man. Hardly decent, Mr. McStowers. It was to Sam Westing's advantage to have a judge in his debt. Needless to say, I have excused myself from every case remotely connected with Westing affairs. You're awfully hard on yourself, Judge, and on him. Maybe Westing paid for your education because you were smart and needy, and you did all the rest by yourself. This is getting us nowhere, Mr. McSouthers. Just right Westing connection, education, financed by Sam Westing, debt never repaid. I feel sorry for her, don't you? That's just sad. Theo, upset over his skid row snooping, took out his anger on the up bottom, poking, oh, on the up button, poking it, jabbing it, until the elevator finally made its way down to the lobby. Slowly, the door slid open. He stared down at the sparkling, sputtering arsenal. Yelled and belly flopped to the carpet as rockets whizzed out of the elevator inches above his head. Boom! Boom! A blinding flash of uh, white fire streaked through the lobby through the open entrance door and burst into a chrysanthemum of color in the night sky. Then the elevator door closed. <laughs> The bomber had made one mistake. The last rocket blasted off when the elevator returned to the third floor. Boom! By the time the bomb squads reached the scene, by the way of the stairs, the smoke had cleared. The young girl was still huddled in the hallway floor, tears streaming down her turtle-like face. Okay, that time I think it was turtle. For heaven's sake, say something, her mother said. Tell me where it hurts. The, bit, the pain was too great to be put into words. Five inches of Turtle's braid were badly singed. Grace Wexler attacked the policeman. Nothing but a childish prank, you said. Some childish prank. Both my children cruelly injured, almost killed. Maybe now you'll do something, now that it's too late. Unshaken by the mother's anger, the policeman held up the sign that had been taped to the elevator wall. The bomber strikes again! On the reverse side was a handwritten composition, How I Spent My Summer Vacation by Turtle Wexler. Grace grabbed the theme and shook it at her daughter who was being rocked in form of box arms. Somebody stole... Somebody stole this from you, didn't they, Turtle? You couldn't have done such an awful thing, not to Angela, not to your own sister. Could you, Turtle? Could you? 
I want to see a lawyer, Turtle replied. The bomb squad faced with six hours overtime filling out forms and delivering the delinquent to a juvenile detention facility, decided it was best for all concerned to escort the prisoner to apartments 4D and place her in the custody of Judge Ford. Judge Ford put on her black robe and seated herself behind the desk. Before her stood a downcast child looking very sad and very sorry. Not at all like the turtles she knew. You surprised me, Turtle Wexler. I thought you were too smart to commit such a dangerous, destructive, and stupid act. Yes, ma'am. Why did you do it, Turtle? To hurt someone? To get even with someone? No, ma'am. Of course not. Turtle kicked shins. She was not the type to bottle up her anger. You do understand that a child would not receive as harsh a penalty as an adult would. That there would be no permanent criminal record. Yes, ma'am. I mean, no, ma'am. She was protecting someone. She had set off the fireworks in the elevator to divert suspicion from the real bomber. But who was the real bomber? Nothing to do but drag it out of her, name by name, starting with the least likely. Are you protecting Angela? No! The judge was astounded by the excited response. Angela could not be the bummer, not that sweet, pretty thing. Thing? Is that how she regarded that young woman? As a thing? And what had she ever said to her except, except I hear you're getting married, Angela, how, or how pretty you look, Angela? Had anyone asked about her ideas, her hopes, her plans? If I had been treated like that, I'd have used dynamites, not fireworks. No, I would have just walked out and kept right on going. But Angela was different. What a senseless thing to do, judge, the judge said aloud. Yes, ma'am. Turtle stared down at the carpet, wondering if she had given Angela away. Judge Ford rose and placed an arm around Turtle's bony shoulders. She had never wished for a sister until this moment. Turtle, will you give me your word that you will never play with fireworks again? Yes, ma'am. While we're at it, do you have anything else to confess? Yes, ma'am. I was in the Westinghouse the night Mr. Westing died. Good Lord, child, sit down and tell me. Turtle began with the Purple Wave story, went on to the whisperings and the bedded down corpse, the dropped peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and her mother's cross, and ended with the $24 she had won. Did either you or Doug Ho who call the police? No, ma'am. We were too scared. We just ran. Is that a crime? The judge said it was a criminal offense to conceal a murder. But Mr. Westing didn't look murdered, Turtle argued. He looked asleep like he did in the coffin. He looked like a wax dummy. A wax dummy? Now Turtle, now Turtle was the one surprised by the excited response. The judge thinks it might have been a real wax dummy, not a corpse at all. Then what happened to Sam Westing? The judge ret retained her composure. Not reporting a dead body is a violation of the health code. But I wouldn't worry about it. Is there anything else, Turtle? Yes, ma'am, Turtle replied, glancing at the portable bar. Could I have a little bourbon? What? Just a little, on a piece of cotton to put in my cavity. My tooth hurts something awful. Relieved at not having a juvenile alcoholic on her hands, Judge Ford prepared the home remedy. Is that better? Good? You may go home now. Home meant going to Baba. Baba loved her no matter what, and Turtle didn't care if the others thought she was the bomber, except Sandy. He was walking toward her right now, walking his bouncy walk, but not smiling. Sandy is disappointed in her. He thinks she hurt her own sister. He doesn't want to be friends anymore. How's my girl? Sandy said cupping his hand under her chin and lifting her head. Whew! Hitting the ball, bottle again? It's just bourbon on my co on cotton for my toothache. You 
Yes, I've heard that one before. Honest, Sanny. Turtle was pointing inside her wide open mouth. The doorman peered in. Woo, that's some cavity. It looks like the Grand Canyon. Tomorrow morning you're going to see my dentist. No back talk. He's very gentle. You won't feel a thing. Promise you'll go? Turtle nodded. Sandy smiled. Good then. Sandy smiled. Good. Then down to business. My wife's having a birthday tomorrow. I thought one of your gorgeous striped candles would make a swell present. There's only one candle left. It's the best of the lot. Six super colors. I spent a lot of time making it. That's why I wouldn't part with it. But since it's for your wife's birthday, Sandy, I'll let you have it for only five dollars. And I won't charge you sales tax. <laughs> Try not to stick your fanny out so far, Angela said from her chair. Now that Sadel Pulaski depended on crunches, she lurched clumsily, hobbled by old habits. Just keep reading those clues. The secretary straightened. Shoulders back, stomach in, until her next step. With their telephone switched off and contagious disease added to the no visitor sign, the bomb victims had privacy at last. Sidel had twice read the entire will aloud. Now Angela, her hands unbandaged, was reshuffling the collected clues. Grains. Spacious. Grace. Hood. Good. Hood. With. Beautiful. Majesties. From. Thy. Purple. Waves. On. No. Mountain. Again, Sadell ordered. Change them around and read either the word on or the word no. Both together are confusing. Good. Spacious. Grains. With. Grace. On. Thy. Purple. Mountain. Hood. Waves. From. Majesties. Beautiful. Someone was at the door. Angela picked up the note that was slipped underneath. Uh, and I am going to stop there. Because <laughs> my oh my, my throat is completely dry. And that is a lot to read. <laughs> but fortunately there's still a lot to read in the book. Decreased by just an hour of reading. Pretty exciting. Um, I hope you guys like it. Um, I know I've been really behind on the videos uh, as far as uploading them, so uh, I promise you guys next week you will get four videos instead of two. Um, just, you know, to make up for my lazy time of not uploading videos, you know. So, and thankfully, uh, the song for uh, round 30 of Game of Bands is already done. Uh, me and my partner have already finished it during the weekend, so I don't have to worry about the deadline this weekend. I can just concentrate on videos. Oh, tomorrow, uh, to Saturday morning, I am going to a uh, meeting for Special Olympics. Global Messenger, can you believe it? I'm going to a, an orientation to become a global messenger for Special Olympics. I'm excited. Um, it's pretty much, you know, being a speaker for them. And um, it's funny because my coach emailed me this um, flyer type thing about the whole about the whole meeting and stuff like that. And I realized uh, that my the person I meet once a week for my life skills training, she was... Uh, at the time, she was saying, you know, how good of a public speaker I am and stuff like that. And, and, how, and I realized how much my life has changed in the past few years. And so I realized I might as well try to, you know, become a speaker for Special Olympics. I can tell people how my life has changed so much since I've been an athlete and getting so much from my group home. You know, it's just so amazing, you know. And not to mention doing these 
video videos on YouTube. It's definitely been helping me on my public speaking. I'm excited. <laughs> you know? So, uh, I hope that goes well. Wish me luck. Um, and so now I will leave you guys to it to enjoy your day and I hope you had fun listening to my reading and my quick little update just now. So, I will see you guys later. This is the Esperanza Tukutu, signing off.